Let's pray. Father, thank you so much uh, for your love and your grace, God. And, and we're excited to come to your word this morning and to hear what it is that you have to say to us, Lord. And help us to understand it, Lord, that we might apply it to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're in Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to look at the entire chapter this morning, even though it's 46 verses, we'll move rather quickly. But the title of our message is The King's Warning. In what has been called the Olivet Discourse, that's Matthew chapters 24 and 25, Jesus described a seven-year period of time just before the end, unlike any other in history, a time so filled with suffering and affliction that if Jesus himself did not intervene, everyone on planet Earth would die. Even with Jesus' intervention, one half of the Earth's population will die. The book of Revelation describes it as the great tribulation. Before this seven-year tribulation period, Jesus Christ, praise the Lord, will come and take the church back to heaven to be with him, where we will be with him during the entire seven-year period. In other words, the church of Jesus Christ will not go through the seven-year tribulation period. Yes. It's worth something, a hallelujah. <clears throat> and I love what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. God did not appoint us to wrath. That's the wrath of the tribulation period. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, at the end of this seven-year tribulation period, Jesus Christ will come back to this earth to defend Israel, to judge the nations, and to set up his kingdom. Now, this all of it discourse is prophecy, and the purpose of prophecy is not to entertain the curious, but to encourage true believers to live for the Lord. John put it this way, 1 John 3, 3, and everyone who has this hope in him, that's the hope of his return, purifies himself just as he is pure. And so knowing that Jesus could come and take us to be with him in heaven, at any moment we prepare our lives for that. And so the last part of this Olivet Discourse, it's all application. Look back, if you would, at a moment at verse 42 of chapter 24. Jesus said, watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. So we're to be watching for our Lord's return. And that doesn't mean that we're to stand outside and look up into the sky. That's not what that means. It means that we're to be alert, to be aware of the times in which we're living and living as though Jesus could come at any moment because he could, as well as telling those who don't know the Lord that the Lord's coming and sharing with them the good news of salvation so that they might also be ready for his coming. And then look at verse 44 of chapter 24. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. And so the end time scenario looks like this. The rapture of the church which could come at any moment. The seven-year tribulation period upon this earth. The second coming of Jesus Christ at the end of that seven-year tribulation period. And then Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom on this earth for a thousand years. It's called the millennium. Well, who exactly is going to be allowed into that kingdom? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> because Jesus is going to tell us that in chapter 25. And what we have here in chapter 25 is the judgment of the Jews and the Gentiles living at the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ. In other words, those that have made it through the seven-year tribulation period. Remember, half of the earth doesn't. Those Jews who are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ show themselves to be true by being ready, by watching and waiting. And those Gentiles who are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ show themselves to be true by their support of Israel during that tribulation period. Let me show you what we mean. First of all, in verses 1 through 13, we have the parable of the ten virgins, and that has to do with the salvation of the Jews, those living at the second coming of Jesus Christ. They're not the church. The church is already in heaven at this point. Then, verse 1, 
When Jesus, you see, comes at the end of the tribulation to set up his kingdom, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other, that's the foolish virgins, came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. And now the application in verse 13, watch therefore, for you know neither the day or the hour in which the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is coming. The wise virgins here are the believing Jews who are ready. They have oil in their lamps. They've come to faith in Christ when the bridegroom comes. They are the attendants at the wedding. The foolish virgins are the unbelieving Jews. They have no oil in their lamps. When Jesus Christ comes back to this earth at the end of the tribulation period, oil is always symbolic in the scriptures of the Holy Spirit. The unwise are not saved. They're not true believers. The bridegroom, of course, is Jesus Christ who comes back at the end of the tribulation to judge the nation Israel. Those Jews who have made it through and weren't killed during the tribulation. The marriage is the marriage supper of the Lamb when Jesus Christ comes back to the earth with his bride. Who's his bride? The church. We've been with him for seven years. He comes back at the end of that seven years with us. And the marriage supper now marks the beginning of the kingdom of heaven on this earth, the millennium. The believing Jews, the wise Jews, are allowed into the marriage feast into the kingdom, and the unbelieving uh, Jews at the return of Christ, the foolish virgins, are not allowed into the kingdom of heaven. The door is shut. Now, in the Jewish wedding, the bride uh, goes back to the groom's house, the father's house, for a honeymoon, uh, typically seven days. Of course, we're going back for seven years, and they come back to the bride's house for the wedding supper. They're coming, we're coming back to this earth. And the cry is made at the return of the Lord, behold, the bridegroom is coming. In other words, the wedding procession is coming. And all the bridesmaids, the virgins, come running out to meet the bridegroom. The second coming of Jesus Christ is what's being pictured here. It answers the original question of the disciples back at the beginning of chapter 24, what will be the sign of your coming, sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? But notice what made the wise wise and the foolish foolish. Oil or the lack of it. We used to sing a song, give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. (laughs) It's the Holy Spirit. But notice what happens to those that are not ready. The door is shut. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You were never mine. Back in Matthew 7, 22, Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. That's the same thing he says here in this parable. Depart from me, you that practice lawlessness. A lot of people do wonderful things, but we're not saved by works. We're saved by faith and trust in Jesus alone. But again, the application, watch, therefore, For you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And so every generation of believers is told to be watching, to be ready. And the effect of watching is being ready. But notice, very carefully, you don't have to be wicked to not make it into the kingdom of heaven. You can miss it by being foolish. Those who profess to be saved but never really were. 
They didn't have the Holy Spirit. Paul explains this wonderfully to the church in Rome in chapter 8, verse 9, but he says, now if anyone does not have the Holy Spirit, he is not of Christ. It's pretty simple. No one's born again. No one's a genuine believer. No one's a Christian apart from having the Holy Spirit in their lives. He's given to us. He comes to us once we're saved. Well, the primary application here in this parable is for the Jews who are alive at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Personal salvation is the issue in order to be ready when Jesus Christ comes and be allowed into the kingdom. They need to get saved during the tribulation period. The secondary application is to us who are alive when the rapture of the church comes, the saved will go and the unsaved will be left behind. Do we have oil in our lamps? Are we saved presently? In other words, you need to be saved or you're going to be left behind. It's pretty simple. A true saving faith in Jesus Christ will be characterized by, by a watching and waiting for his return. And that's what's illustrated here by the parable of the ten virgins. Everybody okay? Let's move on to the second one, the parable of the talents. This is now verses 14 through 30, and this also has to do with the Jews who are alive at the time of the second coming of Christ. They've lived through and made it through the tribulation. For the kingdom of heaven, verse 14, is like a man traveling into a far country, so there's a time element involved, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. A talent is an exchange of or a unit of exchange, and to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded them and made another five. He's now got ten. And likewise, he that received two gained two more. He's now got four. But he who received one went and dug, notice the butt? Something's not right there. Uh, he went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Notice whose money it is. And after a long time, there's your time element again. And the time period here happens to be between the first coming and second coming of Christ. The Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received the five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, that is the five talents, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord, which in the context is the kingdom of heaven upon this earth. That person's allowed to go into the kingdom. Look at verse 22. He also who received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. That's two talents. And I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You also entered into the kingdom. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you were a hard man reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there, is, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reaped where I hadn't sown and gathered where I'd scattered, uh, scattered no seed. Therefore, you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers so that at my coming I would have received back my own with interest." Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, you haven't done anything with what God's given you. Even what he has will be taken away. And then verse 30, and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the lake of fire. This situation was well known in Jesus' day when a property owner would go on a long journey and entrust his property and servants and all uh, to the responsibility of keeping his house going. And the application here, Jesus is the householder. He's gone away on a long journey preparing a place for you and I in heaven. And in the meantime, he's given us talents. And that can be money or energy or abilities or, or gifts 
or time. Every one of us has 24 hours, obviously, in a day. Use it wisely. And God is telling us that while we wait for him to come, he wants us to be productive for his kingdom and with his things. He wants us to bear fruit. And whatever God has entrusted into our care, he expects us to use it to produce results for the kingdom of God, not to be slothful and just bury it. Well, what, what he's given to us, it's not ours to begin with. The amount happens to be according to that person's ability. But notice the rewards are the same. Faithfulness to the abilities that God has given us. You know, Billy Graham's not going to receive any more reward than one of us might if we are as faithful to what little he's given us at, to what he was to the large amount of ministry God gave to him. Isn't that wonderful? We have the same opportunity for reward. This parable also seems to indicate that our position in the kingdom of heaven then will be relative to our faithfulness to the things that God has entrusted to us now. His giftings and talents and abilities and opportunities. So what are we doing with what God has given to us? To the church in Ephesus, Paul wrote in verse 5, or verse 15 of chapter 5, he said, See, seeing then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We don't have much time left. And then John 12, 35, Jesus said, a little while longer, the light is with you. While you have the light, walk in it, lest darkness overtake you, because he that walks in darkness doesn't know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Remember where the unprofitable servant was cast? into outer darkness. They reject the light. God says, then I'll give you outer darkness. So the parable of the ten virgins focused upon being ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ by watching for his return. And the parable of the talents focuses upon being ready for the second coming of Christ by working. Using the opportunities that God's given to us to further his kingdom. All the servants in this parable, the one with five talents, two talents, and, and, and one talent, they were all servants. All three servants claim to belong to the Lord here, and all three ser servants do belong to him, but only two of them were genuine believers. The prerequisite here for commendation is faithfulness over a few things. Aren't you glad he didn't say a lot of stuff? <clears throat> The first two servants are saved. The third one is not a true believer. Though they might have professed a belief in Christ, it never took root. Look at the promise to these faithful servants in verse 21 and 23 again. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Hey, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you understand what joy is. Joy is an, an inward blessing. It's happiness that's not contingent on the outward circumstances. And it's wonderful now. We have a joy related to the Lord's presence in our lives and the promises that he's made to us, but enter into the joy of the Lord then. Now is nothing compared to what it's going to be like then. Praise the Lord. But here the person actually accuses the Lord of being unfair. The attitude of their heart exposes them as unbelievers and their actions revealed their apathy. They didn't do anything, though they had the same opportunity as the others. Here's another truth here. If we commit our lives to Christ and take advantage of the opportunities that he lays before us, he will give us more. The primary application of this parable is to the Jews who are alive at the second kingdom of Christ. What they did or did not do during that time as believers exposes them as either genuine or not. He will separate them at the end. The believing Jews at his second coming will be allowed into the kingdom. The unbelieving Jews at his second coming will be cast into the lake of fire. That's what he's doing. Now, there's a secondary application to us who are not Jewish. 
who are part of the church. What are we doing presently with the opportunities that God has given to us? A true saving faith in Jesus Christ will be characterized by using what the Lord has given us to further his kingdom. And there's lots of ways to do that. Now, these parables can sometimes look as though works are necessary for salvation, but what they represent are the works that go along with a genuine salvation. Does that make sense? You see, faith alone saves, but a faith that saves, it's not alone. There are works that follow it. A true faith will work itself out in acts of love, loving and serving others. Now, what we have in verses 31 through 46 is the judgment of the nations. And this is dealing with the Gentiles who are alive on planet Earth that have, their lives have been spared through this seven-year tribulation period. They're not a part of the church. The church is gone. But they've made it through the tribulation period. Look at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the holy angels with him, that's at the end of the tribulation, his second coming. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Did you know he's going to set up shop in Jerusalem? It's going to be so awesome. And all the nations, some translations say heathens. What it means is Gentiles. The Jews call them goyim. What does that mean? Well, they're not Jewish. They're Gentiles will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another. Notice how, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And I've seen this several times over in Israel. When our guide would stop uh, the busload of us, and we'd get off, and there's a shepherd there, and he's got a whole group of sheep and, and, and goats that are all mingled together following him. And our guide will say something to the, to the shepherd, and the shepherd will say just a couple of words, n- nothing that we can understand, and it, it's an amazing thing. All of a sudden, all the sheep will line up on the shepherd's right-hand side, and all the goats will line up on the left-hand side. It's, I've seen it several times. And then the, guy, the, then the shepherd will go, hey, could I get a couple bucks from you? It's funny. You know, that's tourism. <laughs> but this is, this is exactly what happens. And then he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. These will be allowed into the kingdom, obviously. And why? Notice, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. I, I can't help but think of the Keith Green song back in the, in the early or late 70s and early 80s. You see, their good works didn't save them, but was proving their faith here. Then the righteous, that's the sheep on his right hand, will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we do that? Or, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king, that's Jesus, will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it, unto one of the least of these, my brethren. Who are Jesus' brethren? The Jews. During the tribulation period, you've done it to me. I am saddened by what I see the church, not only our country, turning away from the nation of Israel, and the support of them, but I see it in the church as well. And if it's the criteria that the Lord's going to use to separate the sheep from the goats, the believers from the unbelievers in the tribulation, I think it's pretty important now. I'm really troubled by what I see in the church, uh, unfortunately. Then, verse 41, he will say to those on the left, these are the goats, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Just like the other parable of I never knew you. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you didn't take me in. Naked, you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. No good works. Why? Because there was no genuine faith. 
Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or, or stranger or naked and sick or in prison and didn't minister to you? And he will say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you didn't do it unto me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The sheeps are the believing Gentiles who get saved during a tribulation. These are ones that are not killed. A lot of them will get killed. And they prove their salvation by supporting the Jews who are being persecuted worldwide by the Antichrist and his minions. Clothing them, feeding them, visiting them in prison, proving their love for God and for his people. They're true believers. I can't help but think of someone like Corey Ten Boom who did that. <clears throat> I ran across the story of a, of a, a believer during World War II, a soldier over in Europe. And he entered a, a city on a certain day and, and, he, and he met a beggar that was in rags and it was, it was just freezing cold and he didn't have any money. Uh, so he cut his army coat in half and he gave his half of his coat to this, uh, this beggar. And that night he had a dream and he saw the Lord in half a coat. Could you dig that? Half an army coat. Inasmuch as you've not done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've not done it to me. But inasmuch as we have, we've done it unto the Lord. We're the extension of the Lord, you see. And that'll be the criteria for who makes it into the kingdom, the Gentiles that'll make it into the kingdom after the tribulation period. James put it this way. If you've got this world's goods and you see someone in need and you don't help, how does the love of God dwell in you? The goats, known to be more uh, frisky and rebellious than sheep, represent unbelievers during the tribulation period to prove their unbelief by not helping God's people, the Jews, by not loving them, not caring for them. Now, the primary application is to the believing and unbelieving Gentiles during the tribulation period, how they treat God's chosen people proves whether they're saved or not. The secondary application is for us as believers in this present age. Are we loving the Lord and are we loving his people and in support of them? I'm not for a moment suggesting that Israel does everything right that they're supposed to. They don't. They're ungodly just like we are. But they're still God's chosen people. And he's going to judge this world by how we treat them. A true faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ will be characterized by loving God and loving his people, the Jews, and caring for them. Now, by the time the Lord Jesus Christ gets through with his judgment of this world, represented by these three parables, there will only be true believers left. Jews and Gentiles would be allowed to go into the kingdom. And it's those believers, Jews and Gentiles alike, who have made it through the seven-year tribulation period that will be ushered into the kingdom of heaven, the thousand-year reign of Christ upon this earth. We, the true church, who have come back with the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of the seven-year tribulation period, we're already in glorified bodies. Those of us that have passed away before have met the Lord in the air and, and our bodies have been raised from the dead and we meet our spirits which are with the Lord now and those of us who are alive and remain and be caught up when the Lord blows the trumpet, we're not going to die. We're going to be glorified right there along with them. One great reunion. Go back to be with the Lord. We come back to this earth with the Lord and we are going to live in glorified bodies. We are done, saved, thoroughly saved and we will rule and reign with Jesus Christ upon this earth. But those that have gone through the tribulation period... They weren't a part of the church, saved Jews and Gentiles alike, will make it into the kingdom in natural bodies, just like we have now, and they will procreate. And their children will have to make a decision for Jesus Christ. And they have a thousand years to do that. And then the Lord will, there'll be another judgment. Un unbelievable that at the end of that, you are ruling and reigning with the Lord upon the earth, you know, and then there's people who, realize that Jesus Christ is here. They have the history. They've seen it all, and they still don't turn to him. Unbelievable. At the end, there's actually a rebellion. But those tribulation saints in their natural bodies will produce children 
during the millennium and their children will have to come to Christ or face the judgment of all believers of all time, which is the great white throne judgment at the end of the thousand years. And we're told anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And then we have what's called the eternal state. From then on, we're with the Lord. Tell you what, the Lord has wonderful things planned for us who believe in him. It's going to be great. The eternal state where the holy angels are, those that didn't sin, and all believers of all ages will be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever. Amen? Amen. Old Testament saints, church-age saints, tribulation saints, holy angels, it's going to be awesome. So what have we seen in chapter 25? A true saving faith in Jesus Christ will be characterized by a watching and waiting for the Lord's return. Amen? I'm nervous when people say things like, uh, you know, watching and waiting for his return, it's a waste of time. Unfortunately, I've heard that in the church. Not a good stance. A true saving faith in Jesus Christ will be characterized by serving the Lord, by using what the Lord has given us to further his kingdom. And a true saving faith in Jesus Christ will be characterized by loving the Lord and loving his people, the Jews. Don't be like the foolish virgins who thought they had more time. And while they slept, the bridegroom came and the door was closed. Boy, I bet you that was a terrible sound of that door closing and then coming back, pounding on the door and it doesn't open. Wow. Here's the difference. We first of all need to realize that we're sinners. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We don't reflect the nature and character of our God because we've fallen from that. Secondly, we have to recognize that Jesus Christ died for our sins. We can't do it on our own. You can never polish yourself up enough to get saved. You, just, you can't do it. God can't even look at that. You think that he's going to receive what you did or what I did instead of what his son on the cross did? You think, well, there's, then you don't know the father. <laughs> for he loves the son. And the son loves the father. I can't think of a bigger slap in the face than somebody standing before God's judgment seat saying, this is what I did. I, that's the biggest slap of the face in the face at all. You mean what my son did means nothing to you? I can't even imagine that. Thirdly, we have to repent of our sins. We have to come to a place in our lives where we turn away from our sin and turn towards the Lord. And then lastly, we have to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And uh, I'm, I'm frightened, honestly, at, at what I believe to be uh, people who have sat in churches and never made this kind of commitment. Oh, they've come close. Who think they can sneak in and out with never having made. And, 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 and we're not saved by raising our hands or by a certain prayer, or, or doing this in a certain place, but have never made this kind of commitment to the Lord. I never want to give the impression that it's what you do here at Calvary Chapel on Sunday morning after the service when the altar call comes that saves you. It doesn't. It's an opportunity to be saved. But you are saved. I am saved by our faith alone in Jesus Christ and what he did on that cross 2,000 years ago. And, and, and don't be foolish <laughs> like those virgins. Be ready when the Lord comes. How are you ready? By getting saved. Amen? Amen. Uh, let's all stand.